Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We are your hosts, Karan and Kristen. On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Today, we are chatting with Andy Hickman, the founder of Art of Workflow, a high-touch coaching practice that empowers business owners, married couples, and entrepreneurs to get lifelong closure on ideas they have in the shower. Andy is passionate about the art of teaching and has spent his entire career in education, middle schoolers, in fact, and he is the author of The Art of the Art of Workflow Story, the world's first comprehensive email-based book that explains the practical nuts and bolts of attention, flow, and organization. And Andy has been invited to speak for many groups, such as the congressional members of the United States. And his most important speaking engagement is, of course, speaking with us here today. (laughs) Welcome. Thank you so much, Kristen and Karan. I'm, yeah, excited to play around and have fun. Us too. So <laughs> we, yeah, we were chatting a little before this and we want to, we want to know where your pirate journey started that brought you to where you are today. Mm, yeah, I appreciate that. And also just as a fun side note, I really appreciate that you guys always start your podcast with a story. Like I kind of like in, in, engage with other podcasts now. I'm like, oh man, there's no story at the beginning, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my story, I feel like for me began, um, actually, I'll start the story with a story. And this is a real story. I had a uh, friend in uh, college that um, him and a couple of his buddies lived off uh, campus. And this was like really cool and hip because it was like, you know, sophomore year or something. So because he was off campus, uh, they could kind of like they had different rules that they could, you know, play by. And so one of the rules, um, him and his friends were Christian and they would go out into the community and find people that sort of just need a little bit of extra help and, and let them live in the house with them. So they, uh, over the, over two or so years, they housed, uh, uh, you know, various different people that were living on the streets. Uh, one person really kind of stood out, uh, in their mind and kind of was like seared in their memory forever because uh, his unusual story, which was he had a uh, missing hand and they kind of always thought like, I don't know, it's like a little bit weird, probably shouldn't talk about it or something, you know, but like everyone was thinking like, you know, what happened to his hand and somehow they were hanging out in the living room and there was like a natural transition to ask this guy, you know, it was the story behind his missing hand. And he, he was like really confused that they were asking this question of him, uh, you know, which kind of confused them. Cause he's like, what? Like you should totally know why I am missing a hand. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you, you boys are uh, Christian boys and you've read the Bible and you've read uh, Matthew uh, chapter five, verse 30. If your if your hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off. And uh, this man had literally done that. He had done that. And my story is very similar to that man's story, except it didn't really take primarily a physical manifestation, but more a uh, psychological uh, manifestation. So around mid high school, a complicated set of factors resulted in me accepting a belief that um, that God basically wanted me to destroy myself. Um, and so I didn't I didn't consider uh, physical like suicide. It wasn't like there were suicidal thoughts. Um, but I definitely believe that the like what what I was being called to um, was a sort of a self, sacrifice, but not in like the way we typically hear it, but in a very literal way. I like miss those, you know, like contextual cues or something that like, this is not supposed to be 
uh, taken literally. So um, I went through a very bizarre uh, four or so years in which I um, basically strove for that goal. And in those four years, I um, intentionally kind of destroyed my intuition and kind of desires that I had internally uh, because I was working under this premise that in order to be um, who I was called to be, I basically needed to not be who I was, right? And uh, the body can only take so much of that for so long. So a breaking point for me was um, I was hanging out with um, a friend at the time and my, uh, my body just broke out into hives, like kind of like head to toe. I was like, man, I like, I don't really like, you can't really hide something like that, you know, anymore. And I remember my friend being like, like, what, uh, are you like allergic to something, <laughs> you know? And, uh, it was, it was basically a foreseen, uh, a, a wall in which my own intuition was kind of pulling the eject button or like emergency brake or something like that. And so um, what helped me navigate out of that was getting back in touch uh, with me by getting back in touch with my thoughts. Um, and um, one way that it just bubbled up this morning, I was kind of walking around. I was like, you know, I kind of didn't know Maybe I knew in one sense, but I wasn't being myself until I had to fight and, and until I had to write. And it was once I started externalizing my thoughts that I started to have clarity on what really uh, is true. Like, who actually is God? Who actually am I? What does that relationship look like? And, um, yeah, it was a kind of a slow and painful process of trying to re bring out, out of atrophy, my, my intuition. Um, you know, you, you exit, eventually I graduated from college and was, you know, go, went through those natural transitions of like, holy moly, I thought college was tough, you know, and you're like, enter the working world. You're like, this is insane. I can totally understand why. The, the default is you become a zombie and you like kind of just live a very plain, uh, maybe peaceful in one sense, uh, life in suburbia and just kind of like die and nobody comes to your funeral. And uh, like that, that made a lot more sense because like there's so much work, right? But it was going through those levels of college to working world, working world to getting married, getting married to having kids. So they increasing amounts of weight on you in terms of the kind of information that you have to manage, um, the kind of, uh, yeah, like cognitive pressure and almost like, you know, I, I have three girls, they're always, you know, climbing on dad and whatever. When you have your six-year-old on your shoulders, you become a lot more aware of your posture. And similarly with life, more and more weight was being put kind of on like my cognitive shoulders, right? And was making me more aware of, gosh, my, like I both have bad cognitive posture, whatever that is, and I need to get good posture. Otherwise, like this is going to be really hard. Well, because my previous experience of kind of like almost like this weird self-destruction, I had spent so much time doing that inner work that I felt a lot more like confident in the lay of the land of my own mind, right? And so as I started to read different books on how to get organized and uh, you know how to be more productive and whatnot, I started to see um, patterns and um, maybe paradoxes that I think a lot of people miss. And I used that uh, life experience of mine to make sure that whatever kind of methodology that I was going to try out or whatever kind of book or app or something like that, I was never going to let that outside thing be the main driver, right? There, there, whatever it was, even when I externalize my thoughts to sort of get organized, I'm externalizing them in a sense to 
better internalize them. And um, because of my own tradition where I was brought up, uh, I was a lot more familiar with ancient thinkers and medieval thinkers. And so I did research to try to synthesize, okay, there's lots of different modern people. We got David Allen and Peter Drucker and Stephen Covey. And um, they're, they're saying good things. Um, but the tendency, especially now, is to emphasize software as a solution. And I wanted to see if I could make an argument that was going to span time and show that you could build a framework for getting clear, getting organized, having more ease in your life, not off of an app that you install, but off of things that are already natural to us and to any of us. So regardless of profession or regardless of um, age to a certain extent, I do work with some teenagers and that's a little bit harder. Um, but profession or personality, none of that matters if you can build a system off of human nature itself. So I went through kind of a, a exploratory journey of trying to synthesize um, Aristotle, Aquinas, and David Allen. So this is a you know major thinkers from ancient, medieval, and modern times. And through that process, I came up with a behavioral framework of four behaviors. And these behaviors help you get clarity on command and maintain a sense of ease in your organization. And so, yeah, it was learning kind of the hard way that the intuition is not this like enemy of strategy. It's not an enemy of um, order. And uh, order should never be the enemy of ease and spontaneity or any of those things. Um, yeah, and that, what that leads to me doing now is I try to help people um, achieve and experience that sense of order in their lives, not just so that they can like get things under control, but almost so that once they get things under control and they're confident in being able to do that, they can get themselves a little bit out of control again and get creative, right? And pick up a new hobby or um, tap back into some sort of form of self-expression. And that's what I think productivity really tries to get at if it's a, a healthy form. That, um, the getting, getting in control to get back out of control, um, it stands out to me in the sense of like, I, when I talk with people that are scared of, um, taking a step forward or, uh, really learning about themselves, it usually is a fear of control, like lack of control. Like if I allow myself to do this thing, I don't, yeah. I'm not in control anymore. So I like how you're um, helping them feel control so that they can allow themselves to be out, go out of control because it isn't a bad thing to be, to let yourself go out of control um, and go mm -hmm. with the flow. And cause that's where creative creativity stems from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that reminds me of like learning the steel mace, right? Like, I don't know if you know much about the steel mace, but like, <laughs> yeah. I've been you, hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. Like you learn the, the basics, you learn the structure so that you can have flow. Right? Yeah. Like it's, it's one before the other. Right. You know, um, you guys would like this. I heard something like, you know, people always talk about the importance of scaffolding and like scaffolding mm -hmm. is like this image that we use for, and I, I, Chris and you were in education for a while, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I heard it used differently the other day. And I thought it was so cool in the sense of, so scaffolding, typically we're like thinking it's like this bare bone form of structure that helps someone do something, okay? But this person, I don't remember who it is, otherwise I'd give them a shout out, was emphasizing the fact that scaffolding is eventually designed to be taken away, mm -hmm. right? And so I love that because it's like, I think there can be a um, tendency to sort of like unnecessarily oppose things against each other. And so like in the, the stereotypes kind of bring this out and you can have someone who's like, I need to control everything in my life. And then you have like the crazy, you know, either like hippie or like super messy artist, right? And um, what if we could like bring both of these things into synthesis with each other and have a sense of order 
but like like the scaffolding it's like you learn these things and you it's, you don't get there in any random way there's a very particular way that you get there but then once you're there the goal is to not always just be looking at like have the manual or the road like the rule book in your pocket but to like not need it anymore and to get out there and play a little bit and uh improvise yeah follow your compass instead of your map charting your own mm. course. charting your own course <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> talk- yeah <laughs> yeah we had this conversation it reminds me of the conversation with uh, adam chin mm. and he talked was talking about a period of his life like living with no rules but that it there came a point where it was too far in that direction and he had yeah. to like, kind of pull it back rein it in mm-hmm. and have some rules like some guiding principles right rather than like all flow all the time <laughs> yeah yeah all flow is no flow you know yeah, it's yeah. like so but so like talk to that a little bit because it's like okay it seems like with this podcast you're pushing against a certain thing right you're pushing against like unnecessary cemented in rigidity right Mm -hmm. and uh you know you're saying like breaking the rules for good right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like could you also speak to the other side of that in the sense of like so some rule like there's breaking rules but then like what are some rules that you guys live by that you're like oh i wouldn't want anyone to break those you know what i mean yeah. The pirate code. Yeah. Our pirate code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so having like a code that you live by, mm-hmm. yeah. is, like it is, is important and foundational so that, you know, mm-hmm. like these are your values, right? So yeah. you still have your values and your code that you live by. And when we talk about breaking the rules for good, we talk about the things that like, it might be a societal rule, but it doesn't necessarily make sense. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. Like an extreme example, like, okay, you're a woman. So your job is to get married and have children and then stay home and be a homemaker. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So like breaking those rules and, and not being married, not having kids and, you know, or like both of us quitting our corporate jobs to go into business ourselves in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. That seems like a really <laughs> terrible idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But breaking these rules for what we know to be uh, the best for us or, or right for us um, yeah. and, not, and not necessarily what society expects of us or what we quote unquote should be doing. Um, so yeah, the, the rules that you don't break, those would be your code or your values that you live mm-hmm. by. Yeah. And do, do either of you uh, view that as... Um, an act of rebellion or an act of reforming which one like when you come up into something that you're like this this contradicts my code right Mm -hmm. what do you do to that thing that contradicts your code do you break it It depends on what it is yeah maybe you have that realization that you're your code needs to be dynamic that what mm-hmm. you thought was true um at the time maybe isn't necessarily true anymore right um, so that thing like mm-hmm. adjusts your code yeah and you yeah. can pivot mm-hmm. and you can change direction and in, in your mm-hmm. life right so i think that yeah. i think that's a good thing about the code is even even though it is like the the values that you live by that they can be dynamic and change as you change and as the world changes mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And thinking like, if you were to look at it, um, from the educational standpoint too, of like, let's take kids into this picture of, um, if you have mm-hmm. no code, um, it's like, it's like Lord of the flies, like <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen. Anything can happen, but right. maybe the worst. Um, whereas like in, in the educational system, like think of the strictest teacher you've ever had. The kids are fearing that teacher. Like, how is that environment? Um, and then being able to like 
go from the opposite of like the kids are running this classroom to I'm running this classroom. There is no individuality here. How do you marry in the middle to be able Mm -hmm. to have structure, but also allow the kids to be kids. And so it's that finding the balance and because kids are different, they change from day to day. That structure mm-hmm. also, like in the education department, working with middle schoolers, I imagine like for you, you, you had to change like a rule that worked one day may not work the next day or the next year um, mm-hmm. or with from student to student. So yeah, if you look at it too, in the perspective of like, if I were to use this with kids, um, how is this going to go? It's not going to stay the same every single day because they're changing all the time or right. they rebel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Oh man. Yeah. Middle schoolers, especially. <laughs> yeah. I will give a shout out to the middle schoolers. So like there's all the horror stories, but if you, there are some people that it's the right fit. And I think it's more, eighth graders are the worst <laughs> like <laughs> six and seventh graders were so much fun but anyway that's another story yeah they're little weirdos <laughs> but that's that's what makes them so fun <laughs> right exactly yeah, yeah yeah i'm i'm interested to go back to like the start of your your story and your journey mm-hmm. there and yeah. I'm wondering if you would share with us the type of things that you were denying yourself um, in that, like you said, that four-year period of like self, self-sacrifice, what were the kind of things that you were denying yourself and, um, yeah. And your thoughts there. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate that question. Um, cause it also helps direct me, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. You guys talk about like, um, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was almost like the more in one sense, the more mundane stuff, like the hidden stuff was where my like target was. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I knew it at the time, but I think that was being done because I, I feel like that's where the magic really happens. Like the mysticism is in the mundane, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So like, I have a very clear memory of, being around the table with my family um, at, at Thanksgiving and uh, smelling, you know, the turkey. And um, we make really, we make the best stuffing uh, <laughs> ever, like that's ever graced planet Earth. And so I remember smelling that and hearing, you know, looking around, seeing people smile and hearing laughter. And, uh, immediately thinking, uh, that I, I should like step out for a bit, uh, because this is like, I feel, I, I, I don't know. It sounds so crazy, but, but it, but it is true. And I, and I'm, I'm confident that there are some people that will find the podcast and they'll be like, okay, I'm not the only one or something like that. But like the, the mind is capable of destroying itself, you know? And so, yeah, that, that's an example where I'm like, I, I, in that moment, instead of feeling whole and instead of feeling, um, warm, I felt, um, very anxious. And I remember going up to my room and, uh, just, yeah, being, being up there and being very confused because it's like, wait, but like, this is good. Like all that stuff's good there. So like, why it doesn't make sense. Like why, why, why would someone good, i.e. God be against goodness? Mm-hmm. Right. But so that, that was a, a very clear memory, but then also the, the strongest thing was my desire to be a husband and to be a father. Um, That was a a very long uh, and intense battle uh, because that, that it, that was uh, and is my strongest desire. Uh, I, 
have the absolute like the delight of being those two things now. Uh, but that was the number one thing besides the mundane stuff. I guess they're connected to me, though, connected in a way though, that I thought needed to be discarded. Um, so yeah, so it was like, I would, I remember, oh man, if you guys watched the movie, movies can speak to you so powerfully mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, have you ever watched the movie Life is Beautiful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have? Yeah. Brian, but Chris, no. It's no. Uh, that's my all time favorite movie. So it's this um, basically a, a Jewish family uh, that is captured by the Nazis and put in a concentration camp. And uh, the whole time, the, the dad is like doing everything he possibly can to like maintain his children's innocence uh, through this process. And um, that, when I watched that movie, I was just like, oh my gosh, like every fiber in my being is being moved by this. Like to be a father and to be a husband, but like, and all of that was linked with joy. Like the character is really funny. Like, and he's always kind of like making people laugh and, being creative and whatnot. And um, yeah, but so it was so, that that was the central thing. Mm -hmm. Marriage basically is the, is the biggest thing that I thought had to go. But then if that was true, then everything was true. And so you like, you know, I was really into parkour at the time that, that fell off the rails. Um, I was really into, um, I feel like this is actually when I shifted from being an extrovert to an introvert, almost like I used to be super like goofy and whatever. And then it was just like, yeah, well, that's kind of just like this worldly thing too. So I need to let that go. Does that answer your question? It seems like, would it be accurate to say it was a lot of things that would give you a sense of belonging and like community. So like, like walking away from like cool. family gathering or having your own family. Not, not necessarily. Um, and it's really great that you asked that because that helps me bring, that helps me recognize where more was. It was more connected because I could, I, I, I was imagining myself still going towards a path of community. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it wasn't me. So I, the real target wasn't community or belonging. It was basically self-knowledge or like who you know, like the Jackie Chan movies, who am I? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, that's what it was. It was, I, I, like, I thought we use a phrase, or at least in my circles, we use the phrase self-denial, mm -hmm. right? And I was taking that literally, like, I thought like, okay, so then I should deny myself. But the paradox was in trying to deny myself, I discovered myself. Mm -hmm. And then once mm -hmm. I made contact with that, I was like, there's no way that this is supposed to be destroyed. And then that, you know, helped me kind of get to a, a, a greater place of clarity. There's a really, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the writer GK Chesterton, but I really like him, but mm -hmm. he had this, he has this line in his book, orthodoxy, where he says, I did try to, to found a heresy of my own, uh, and when I put the last touches to it, I discovered that it was orthodoxy. Mm. And th that's what it felt like for me very much. Mm. I mean, we've talked a bit before on this uh, on previous podcast about that like collapse distinction between uh, service and sacrifice. We've talked about it in terms of like uh, veterans um, and, and like police, like I was used to be a police officer. Oh, that's um, awesome. And teachers and do it. Teachers, yeah. <laughs> that in order to be of service, it requires our personal sacrifice. And um, you know, I know I spent time unpacking mm -hmm. that collapse distinction because mm -hmm. they don't you don't need to sacrifice in order to be of service. And um Whoa. So that's more mm -hmm. what I'm now what I'm getting off of what you're talking about is that in order for you to properly be of service um and to live your path you needed to mm -hmm. just completely sacrifice and um yeah those th two things don't have to go together <laughs> yeah. it's like um 
people that want to make an impact, um, thinking that to make an impact, I need to serve everybody else and not make any money. Mm -hmm. Where in reality, like yeah, if you want to make yeah. an impact, it's actually very necessary to make money to make an impact. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, that sacrificing yourself to make an impact mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't work out. Um, the word sacrifice is really interesting, right? Like, mm -hmm. because I think the, um, Actually, let me pose this question to you guys. Like, what's the image in your mind when you think of the, when you imagine the word sacrifice? Like what just top of mm -hmm. mind, you know, stream of consciousness, what are things or well, words think, or associations? And I think that's why I really enjoyed the conversation when we, when we talked about veterans and, and like, and uh, emergency service workers, because that sacrifice can literally be physical, like your life, if you're laying your life down on the line. Um, but also is your, your, not your, not only your literal physical life, but like when you're, when you're um, a veteran, like you give up who you are in order to be a part of this, this group. Right. And so that conversation that we had was really, um, and it's with Kristen's husband and his partner. So oh, like talking fun. about, yeah, talking about like refiguring out who you are after you leave the military where you've become like oh, a, yeah. a, a military drone basically. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that same thing in, in the police service where, um, you know, like it's, you're, you have that conversation day one of the police when you're in the police service or maybe even your interview like if needed to like would you lay down your your life to to save someone else right so it is that physical um life sacrifice and like my time in the police completely and utterly changed who i was right so i sacrificed mm -hmm. pre-police cron <laughs> you right. know what i mean and like I think you, a lot of your innocence, um, a lot of time with family because oh, you know, yes, you're, like mm -hmm. all of these things were sacrificed. So when I think of sacrifice, I do think of this, this whole gambit, this whole spectrum of things, um, that we, that are sacrifices, um, that we can do in order to, you know, quote unquote, be of service. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think of this whole spectrum of things. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And what about you, Kristen? Um, in particular, when I think of it, like first thing is the grew up in Christian school. So thinking of like the actual physical sacrifice, like you give something in order to redeem yourself, um, or a, a life of someone or something else. But what also comes to mind is, um, growing up in a church, I watched as my mom, um, did all these things. Like she was, she was caring for us. She was, she had a child, child care in the home too. She's caring for other people's kids. She mm -hmm. ran vacation Bible school every year. So she's doing that. She played piano and organ. So she like, there were times where she would be like, I don't want to do this, but there's no one else to do it today. So mm -hmm. it's, I have to be there. I have to play or no one else will. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like when it came to holidays too, um, she put so much into it. She put herself so last that, um, one of my last holidays, my last holiday that I spent with my whole family back in Michigan, um, woke up in the middle of the night, Christmas Eve, um, after we had had a family gathering of mm -hmm. like, it was at my aunt's place, but my mom mostly took charge of it. Plus she did like, well, she was doing handbells by this point in time too. So she's playing for the praise team, playing the organ and piano, playing handbells, like doing all the things had so many things that Christmas Eve, like she may or may not have even taken time to really sit down and eat or drink anything. And my sister and my dad woke up when she got up to go down to the bathroom, she passed out oh, and man. she had a seizure on the stairs. So I woke oh. up to hearing I'm noises. So yeah. <laughs> oh, I was hearing noises upstairs and go upstairs and, and there was an ambulance there outside of our house. There's guys talking to my mom in the kitchen. Um, they had run an EKG and didn't run and like figure anything out. Um, so they wanted to take her to the hospital yeah. and she's trying to refuse. <laughs> Anyhow, um, turns out they eventually got her to go, um, to the hospital. 
still nothing. They didn't figure anything out. And it was at that point in time, like my husband was going into chiropractic school. So he Mm -hmm. knew a little about the body. Um, Mm. and he's like, these things don't just come out of nowhere, but like, as I learned more and realized what I had done in my own job with the sacrifice I did of myself on what that was doing to my body, I realized my mom sacrificed so much of her that her body physically took a toll and Mm. like, it's time to reset right now. There was no reason why she had the seizure because her body was just like, (laughs) <laughs> so stressed out. Just so out. Yeah. putting herself last. So that's specifically to me, like the most obvious, like when yeah, thinking of sacrifice, is... like, yeah, it's uh, most exposed, Ooh, <laughs> exposed to in my life. So, mm-hmm. Oh man. Uh, uh, Kristen, thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is a potent image, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and then also kind of like you're talking about, um, like you were saying your, some of your Christian background, you're saying mm-hmm. like you're sacrificing something or someone. And so like, what would happen to the person that was sacrificed? They die. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I, what, what I think is pretty typical is like, there's some association of like destruction or, or death around and that's the primary association um i feel like a lot of us have with the word sacrifice and it's just it's stimulating to me to learn that that like the word literally is only means to make holy so like for my particular like experience that like that's like uh you know what i mean because i <laughs> It's like, I was destroying myself because I wanted to be holy. Um, but is that, is that really the, what's the primary thing about sacrifice? Like, is it the destruction makes you holy or is it like, if you're holy, um, you will not, you, if the occasion happens, you will not seek it out. Um, but and you will not be, do it out of guilt or something, but you will lay on your own terms, your own life down for, to, you know, support somebody else or something like that. Right. Um, that I, I felt like I was going somewhere with that, but now, now I don't mm-hmm. remember, but I don't know. Sacrifice is kind of an interesting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, you, you mentioned um, your husband's background in, um, chiropractic care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the phrase jumped out when you're saying these things that these things don't come out of nowhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, that like, that's a lot of what I do, but like for people that are like, I want to be organized or I feel disorganized or something like that. Right. It's trying to empower them with the understanding that, any kind of symptom of overwhelm is like, is not a random thing that's happening, but there, there are behavioral and environmental reasons for that overwhelm. And if you can understand those reasons, then you can eliminate that overwhelm. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, it's weird that we sometimes will default to like, oh, there must, the, it's arbitrary as like an explanation to like fill in gaps in our lives. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. When I think of overwhelm too, I, when I think of myself in overwhelm, um, I am putting a ton of expectations on myself to be a certain way or to do a certain thing. And a lot of that came back to control. I was attempting Mm. to control something within the situation and fell out of control because I was not succeeding at it. (laughs) So Mm. that's Mm -hmm. um, often when for me, when I am like, okay, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Why? Mm. Um, It's often because I was trying to control something and then started bottling things up as well. Like, why isn't it going this way? (laughs) Mm -hmm. You can't control the entire universe and everything in it. I try sometimes. It hasn't worked yet. <laughs> I try so hard. <laughs> I try extra, extra hard. 
So why don't you tell us more about the art of workflow and what, uh, what else you're up to these days? Yeah, cool. So um, the art of workflow, there, we can break that down in a couple of words. Like, so first of all, this is, I, I articulate it as an art rather than a science. So I feel like the kind of productivity space went through like a weird phase that like some people are trying to like black out of their memory. Maybe it was like the um, quantified self movement, right? Whereas like every possible ounce of data about myself, I will log and track and out of good intentions, right? Because we're like, we want more order. But I think it was a mistake to approach the act of organizing as a science. Um, I think it's much more an art. And I view art as the middle of this spectrum. So I would say science is on one, not, not in all areas of life by no means, but like for productivity, it's like, what are we doing? Are we trying to uh, micromanage everything or are we trying to like avoid any kind of uh, sense of organization because it stresses us out or we don't know how to engage with it. And so we're just going to be totally chaotic. Uh, I, I feel art is in the middle, right? And um, art in the sense of this is um, when, when there's an art for something, that means it's like universal. So like there's an art to public speaking, right? Or there's an art to um, listening or you know what I mean? When we say that there's an art for something, we mean that there are fixed principles around that thing. And those principles, even though they're fixed, they don't like fix everything into a static state, but they, they enable ease in whatever that thing is, right? And so for art of workflow, we're talking about workflow is the ordering of work. So the art is the core principles. And for this, it's particular behaviors rather than theories that allow you to order your work. And by order your work, we mean it's not, you can go to your kid's soccer game and just enjoy the soccer game and not be stressed out about thoughts of work uh, or your boss or whatever. It also means that you can actually remember your um, spouse's anniversary and plan a fun surprise, right? Um, and all that is enabled through a, sort of an ecosystem of four behaviors. So that's, and I could go into that, but that's the sort of overview of it. Yeah, you, if you want, go into, or at least briefly, and <laughs> tell us a little sure. bit about those four behaviors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, they are, um, we'll, we'll, let's spend the most time, like we can park on the first, uh, cause th the other ones kind of don't make sense unless the first one makes sense. And typically, yeah. The first one is, um, what we call collecting. Um, but a more fun name would be like listening to your personal assistant. Right. And so this is, we all go through our day and have various thoughts and various things that are um, sort of passing through our mind. Um, we intuitively can tell the difference between something that is in the mind and something that is on the mind. And the first behavior is recognizing, bringing that muscle of recognition out of atrophy to recognize what is on the mind and then to um, externalize it in a very loose way. Okay. So, you know, we, you were mentioning shot, uh, thoughts in the shower in the intro. So that's like a really good example, right? It's like, we tend to, um, there's this dance of like contracting and releasing in, in the creative process. And sometimes we have the best ideas when we move from a state of like being contracted and focused on something to just like letting it go and whatever, and go do something else. So when we go into the shower, we're just saying, whatever, I'm going to go do something else. And then all of a sudden, all the good ideas have space to come up. So the first behavior is all about recognizing, like, I, I have valuable 
things worth paying attention to that I am telling to myself in those moments where I'm like, oh, or like, oh, or they don't even have to be pleasant things. And be like, oh, like I keep forgetting this thing or whatever. The pattern is that people will regularly and chronically think of things and they will have stuff on their mind, uh, but they will not think about them. They won't make eye contact with it. And the first behavior is all about making eye contact with that which is has your attention. Give your attention to what's already has your attention. And you do this primarily, there's different ways to do it. A well, primary way is writing. Um, people have different associations around that word writing. We're talking about something very light and messy and easy and quick. And just, so this can be, you have uh, your notes app on your phone or you have a little pocket notebook. Um, but part of it is building up the habit of having that stuff on hand. And then the other is um, letting stuff like out into that, right? And, and finding that release valve uh, for your mind. Okay. But that, that probably already stirs up a couple of questions. Like what are some thoughts that you have upon hearing that? I was thinking of like, while you were he uh, talking about that, like shower thoughts and creativity. Um, I had a friend, he likes to talk about um, doing creativity bursts. And <laughs> I, when I did one at first, I was like going into my head and I was like, ah, oh, I'm not being creative in this moment. And I was like, wait, I'm actually creating all the time. I'm like, I'm creating this moment yeah. to uh, create, I'm using this moment to create connection with somebody. Um, I'm using this moment to create uh, some space for myself. I'm using this moment to, mm -hmm. yeah, um, create in a different way. But um, part of like those thoughts in our heads too, they're, they are creative. Um, it's just, how are you using them? Are you using them constructively or destructively? Yeah. And are you, are you like, um, almost like missing them because you're mm -hmm. making this assumption that like all the really good ideas are going to happen when I like sit down and I'm like, I'm going to have a good idea right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And, <laughs> and then if that's where your focus is, like you are, amplifying certain things and suppressing other things and you're going to pass by a lot of these um really ripe pieces of fruit that you're trying to give to yourself but you haven't realigned sort of your intuition with your kind of maybe analytical thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I think for me you know one of the things is actually getting things written down yeah so, you know, to what like you talked about so like my journal right here I have like a million nice. of them and um it just helps to like empty the brain first of all and write mm -hmm. what like whatever comes to mind mm -hmm. and then kind of what you were talking about like then you can get a little bit of structure out of that and like a little mm -hmm. really kind of dig into the ideas and the thoughts that are coming out or you look at those and you're like is that accurate <laughs> Mm -hmm. not, not really no mm -hmm. it's not accurate and that just can help to uh clarify things when you actually write it down and like mm -hmm. see it on paper um so yeah so just that that art of writing mm -hmm. is yeah it's an important thing that we use in our coaching as, as well mm -hmm. um yeah. So like, and then what's sometimes fun is to talk about, like, open up the hood on that and be like, well, why does that help? Mm -hmm. And like, what's actually going on there? Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, this phrase that we, that is common for all of us called, I want to make sense of stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to make sense of what's in my head. I think we would do a big favor to ourselves to take that phrase more literally in the sense of let your senses be integrated into the thinking process. Like we can sometimes get in this cycle of think like thinking the only thing about the only way to think is to just like think. Right. And we like, mm -hmm. it's just like all in here. Right. Um, Aristotle talks about the, that all, all men desire to know and the way that we, how he backs that claim up in uh, his book, Metaphysics, 
as he says, we know this by the desire every human has, uh, sorry, the delight that every human takes in their senses. So he connects the physical senses with intellectual knowledge. And that gets picked up in the medieval tradition as well. Aquinas talks about this and he says that the, uh, the physical senses are the material cause of intellectual knowledge. And so part, part of what happens is like, what is our image of who we are? Like, what's a human? Is a human like this ghostly, is a human just a bunch of like dirt that somehow is being held together? Is it like a ghostly soul that like is just hanging out inside this thing? Um, the image that we have of ourselves and of what human nature is affects the way that we engage in the process of thinking. So if we believe um, that the body is not just this thing that is like other than me, right? But if we're taught, if we're going to use words like soul and body, we're going to use them as um, one way it's been put is that the, the soul and the body are not two natures united, but, um, and that can be distinguished from each other for a human, but they are a single nature. And if that's true, then when I think, I want to make sure that I'm making sense of these thoughts. And so part of the reason why writing stuff down feels so nice is because all of a sudden I can see my own thoughts for the first time. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, then I've got something to, to work with, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting those thoughts, thoughts onto paper is one of those things that also Kron and I are big fans of. <laughs> so you can see them, get them, keep them from spiraling too, which is another part of the senses. Like think about them spiraling in your head versus like now you're slowing that down and you're using your hand to write it down on paper. So mm -hmm. adding in that sense of like, it's now a straight line <laughs> and then maybe a few curves here <laughs> and it's a word <laughs> versus all these spirals in your head. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All the senses get integrated in there. And, mm -hmm. and there's some common mistakes I see in this process that might be interesting to talk about. Like, so you were saying like, yeah, getting our thoughts out on paper. Um, what I see is most people will fall in two different categories. So either limit the scope of those thoughts to like to-do list items, mm -hmm. or they'll get really freaked out about to-do list items and they'll be really creative and fun in journaling, mm -hmm. but they won't they like the two parties don't talk to each other a lot. Mm. Right. And so a, a big opportunity is to expand and connect that spectrum of what's a, what's an appropriate thought for me to write down. Like I want to plan my parents, uh, 50th anniversary is just as appropriate as fix a toilet. And that's just as appropriate as, I felt tension with my wife after that conversation. And that's just as appropriate as uh, vacation with my in-laws is creates a weird sensation inside of me. All of those are appropriate so long as they're on your mind. And so what's under all this is this belief that things are on your mind. Again, coming back to that phrase that you were using, Kristen, things are on our mind for a reason. Like, so things don't just happen your body doesn't just go through a, a dramatic breakdown arbitrarily, but it's happening for a reason. And the reason is there is a part of you that knows you can bring closure to that thing. And so it's bringing that up to mind. And so like the tragedy and like the joy or the glory is like the tragedy is like, a, so many people are like hearing those things and they're misinterpreting that as this is stress or like, I don't want to think about those things, right? It's themselves trying to get closure, right? And so the opportunity there is all those answers are within arm's reach. They're coming from you. You already have them. And to get them to a state of clarity doesn't involve some sort of esoteric special kind of thing that it needs to be bought out there. 
but it's all stuff that you already know how to do. It's very sort of natural and organic. And um, it just needs to become a habit. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, with that, where can our listeners go to find out more about you and the art of workflow and anything else they want to learn about you? Yeah, I tried to make it really hard. So I made a, a, a <laughs> website called artofworkflow.com. <laughs> and, and that's the best website. Um, that's the best place to go. So basically on there, what you'll see is um, I've written a, uh, a like a small book. And I like to have conversations with people that are interested in this. So what someone would experience is they would go to this website and they would see a layout of what kind of topics I write about. And this is not a newsletter that someone's like rushing to get done, like, you know, the, the night before it has to go out or ever. It's all already laid out. And um, taking some of the theory behind this and trying to get it to a very manageable bite size, I can take this one thing, I could get closure, I can implement it in my life. And we drip those out one week at a time. And then every once in a while, I check in with my readers and say, hey, do you have any questions? And it's like actually me behind the thing, right? So, and, th and that's where I feel like the magic happens is because again, what you're doing when you have a conversation with someone is you are letting your, your making sense of mm -hmm. what you're trying to make sense of. Yeah, so artofworkflow.com would be the best place to connect. Cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would you recommend our listeners go about starting uh, their own pirate life? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you'll want to buy my special customized planner that, mm -hmm. that um, every year you'll have to buy a new subscription to uh, because you don't actually know how to do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know exactly what to do. Um, the best place to start is to, sometimes it's going to act like, it's going to feel like an act of courage. Uh, sometimes it's going to feel like um, just a, a trust fall or something like that. But what I would encourage the listener to do is don't think that you've if already experienced this because hearing us do it and talk about it is not the same thing. You must actually experience this yourself. You must get a piece of paper. You must get some kind of writing utensil and you must be very open. There's going to be another time later down the road to, to sort of converge on this stuff and figure out where is it going to go and what does it mean? But all those questions are for a later time. For now, get a piece of paper right at the top. What are things that are on my mind? and let it rip. No complete sentences, no judgment, keep it loose. And I promise you, you're going to find something that surprises you. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for the conversation today. I had a learn, learned a lot too. <laughs> yeah. It's really fun. I, I super appreciate what you guys are doing and it's very generous of you you know, we were chatting before you hit record about sort of what's driving you to do this and your explanation of wanting to both inspire people to sort of live that life that they are kind of like maybe afraid to live or something like that, but also to give a platform is very generous of both of you. So I appreciate the opportunity and I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, for sure. <laughs>